Last week, we launched our Best Of series. Suz and Search had so many great moments in 2021 that we couldn't fit them all in one episode. So today, we're back with part two of our favorite moments from Suds and Search this year. Instead of our normal one-on-one interview format, our team found highlights from my conversations throughout the year and pulled out the top quotes, tips, and silly moments from the very best digital marketers in the industry. Grab something cold to drink and join me for part two of the best of Suds and Search 2021. When I first heard Suds and Search, I thought we would be in a bathroom, but we're not. Yeah, I thought we, maybe we could switch it up one of these times and be in a bath, a bubble bath. The beer, it sounds good. Yeah. Because Google is a child. Right. Google right. is a child who wants to understand. But in fact, the brand SERP is what Google thinks the answer is. They are a reflection of Google's opinion, of the world's opinion mm. of you. That's such a and when you thing. think of it that way, you think, ooh, what am I doing wrong? Or what does Google think I'm doing wrong? Yeah, I've actually found myself doing a lot more comparison of a lot of different date ranges and analytics when I'm trying to figure out what, what kind of success are we actually having today. And so I think, you know, not only using your own data, but finding other industry benchmark data is really critical. Gosh, it would be interesting to compare this to Google search trends data to see does, you know, does this, do the search trends really bear out and do they, uh, you know, really map with the revenue that we're hearing that hospitals are, you know, seeing or not seeing. Actually, you know, as, a, as an SEO, it gave me more confidence in that Google search trend data and in how useful it could be for us. The no context Greg question is, talk with your hands and then this is the if you can see my phone this is the visual aid that he has provided <laughs> and i know no more than what i've what i've given you so cheap seo is actually more expensive or cheap paid 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 search is more expensive learning to do digital marketing and keeping up with doing digital marketing isn't really that hard i mean come on seo is not that hard to do it's just a lot of people don't know how to do it but running an agency and running an agency well is really hard. And decision paralysis yeah. sort of effect. If you, if you go to a restaurant, and you pull out a big menu and it's 50 pages right. long. Uh, a, it's harder to decide or find the thing that you want. B, once you actually decide on that thing, you're questioning whether you selected the right thing. Um, so, so like we, we doing a lot of testing around shortening naviga navigation menus um, and something like that can have a significant impact. So once we discover that, well, that now becomes part of our uh, task template, let's say, for new clients that start with us. So when we create that new task list for them, they automatically have this task that says, hey, check their navigation menu. How long is it? Um, okay, it's too long. Well, let's go through it and have a conversation with the business owner and say, what are, what are the top three or maybe five practice areas that you want more business from over the next six months? Let's leave those in. And then we'll create a landing page with all services, all practice areas that we can sort of link to from the navigation menu. That's um, so that, that'd be a yeah, good that's example. That's a great example. It's, it's just uh, what it all boiled down to is people need to pay more attention to what Google is actually doing versus what Google is that's right. saying. There's certain things Google has learned that it's better to try and do a persuasive PR push than a major <laughs> algorithm update. And we you know, I think it's super interesting to study NLP and look at Bert and uh -huh. all these algos and where they're headed. But there's also kind of a gap between the things Google could do in academic computer science and what Google's actually doing today. And right. so we're trying to understand like, okay, we can read the papers and get where they're headed and that's important, but we want to know what they're actually capable of and what, what keywords are basically the same. Because if you know that these two things are the same, then you don't have to worry about it, right? You can pick one and move on with your life. And so I think that's going to be critically important for SEO in the next few years is looking mm. at keyword research as being conceptual and as really understanding what Google equates. Uh, and that's evolved just incredibly in the last five years. It's really important to develop that long-term thinking where you're focused on where are they trying to go? What are they trying to accomplish? And that relates back to the whole conversation we had about user intent in the beginning. That's where they're headed. And that's yeah, where we yeah. need to head. If you're gonna satisfy the largest percentage of users on the high volume query, 
It's going to be because you have the answer to the low volume questions. That's, that's, that's outstanding. Yeah, very good. Where I struggle is where I see these posts all the time from people, like all the time on forums and in Facebook groups where they're like, oh yeah, I've got this client. We're trying to improve the ranking and we're doing posts monthly and we're adding photos. And I'm like, these are not things that are going to increase, increase your client's ranking. Like if that's your end goal, you're going to be disappointed. What are some other things that people can do on their GMB in order to improve their ranking? Yeah, so the other three factors that influence ranking were reviews, um, what website page you link to. So that's one that we are constantly testing because sometimes it makes more sense to link to the homepage. We've seen other cases where linking to the location page actually improves ranking. Um, for practitioners, there's things that you can do like link to, I don't know if it was like a, a doctor and they have a certain procedure that they um, specialize in linking to that page on the website instead of the doctor's profile. Um, so the website field is something you can kind of mess around with. And then the fourth one was categories. Um, and this would just be the only real to do action there is to make sure you have all the right categories on your listing, um, that you put the right one as the primary category. Uh, Cause I, I see that do, done wrong a lot. Um, people want to rank for this query, but they have the wrong primary category. So they don't rank as well. Um, and then keeping up with like new categories. Like if you're an agency, um, we have a free resource on our website where we track GMB category changes and put out ones that are um, new. And so that would be a good thing to track if you're an agency with lots of different types of clients. Um, and for most searchers, uh, for a lot of local businesses specifically, they might not ever hit your homepage. They might literally just go to your GMB profile um, or to map listings or to other type of listings. Yeah, from your point of view, why should small businesses take advantage of posts in GMB? Well, I mean, in my mind, like, if, if, if from a brand perspective, like, it, you know, I think small businesses forget that they have a brand and their brand can drive significant search. And you can own a location services in that area just branded. And everybody knows, yeah, McLean's. What do you need? Oh, yeah, just go to McLean's. Or what do you like? You got problems? Yeah, just, you know, Bob's what, tire and auto. Like, for some of these businesses, they can own their backyard as a brand, but they do a poor job of necessarily creating that, right? Any tips for writing good posts in GMB? I think they're hugely important. I think the most part, like, we forget, like, what we're talking to. So, you know, there's some different post styles, but, yeah. um, you know, I think businesses, for, and a lot of times small to medium businesses, forget about the seasonality of their business forget about the different ways that consumers are coming in and out of their, their customer journey, whatever that is. Um, you know, all of the moments that are happening in the zip geist of everything else, if you're going back to school, then we, there's back to school messaging and there's things that you should be thinking about in whatever local service business you have. So they all have, they probably have 15 to 20 automatic messages that they can sit down and write without even thinking that happen at different weeks in the year. And poster, in my mind, it's the perfect thing where it's not a blog article. You don't have to write a 500 to 800 word article and have links. And it's a chance to really speak to your consumer almost as like a, as like a whiteboard or an easel like you used to set out in front of your shop. You know what I mean? For people to walk by and see. And I know that sounds crazy, but totally. small, sometimes small businesses, That's yeah, fun. they don't need much. We don't need 10, 20, 30 links a month. You know, we need 10, 20, 30 links for the year and we'd be super thrilled. Like, hey, from the very first customer contact, whether that's on the phone and then correspondingly, the very first physical contact, if there's some sort of physical interaction, we need to be setting the expectation that, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Mr. XYZ, whatever the situation is, you know, we absolutely want you to leave us a positive review at the end of this en engagement. That's our goal for this experience. Yeah. And that when you tell people what your goal is, and you, and especially when the goal is intrinsically tied and connected to a, to a mutually beneficial goal for themselves, if I tell you, Mark, I want this to be an excellent podcast today, that's the same thing you want. So we're automatically aligned. Yeah. And, this whole thing now feels like we're on the same team as opposed to I'm trying to upsell you. I'm trying to get you in our program. I'm trying to, I'm the bad guy. I'm the sales guy. I'm the whatever, right? I think that our job as marketers is that we're actually just relationship counselors in the, in the sense that the relationship quite often between the customer and the business is broken, just as a relationship between a husband and wife would be. And I kind of say to the, you know, the board of directors, the people that are really driving the strategy, I say to them, well, what do you want? And they say simple stuff like, 
well, I need to sell more cars. And I say, well, what type of car? And we, we do the usual marketer stuff. But what you get to then is, well, I want to sell more of these um, uh, Fords at this price. You get the nail. I say, okay, yeah. great. And then why aren't you selling more? And they don't know. So you go out to the market to these people who are actually shopping for those cars and you say, why aren't you buying that mm. and them? And then they say, well, I don't trust them. I mean, where, who are they? Where are they? Mm. They say the price is huge compared to all these other deals. And you start to realize, okay, there's missing, there's missing uh, uh, communications here. So you go back to the board and you say, well, they say the price is too high. So you need a better deal. You need to sharpen that pencil. Um, they say, well, I can't sharpen the pencil, but what I can do is add more things onto it. And you go back to the consumers. Mm. And what if it was like this? And the consumers say, oh yeah, I'd buy it if it was like that. And then all of a sudden you connect the two back up again. And if you spend your whole entire day looking for things that are broken in that relationship and you repair them, your satisfaction and, and success metric is a conversion. And I think that's the roundabout pragmatic way that I, I see marketing. And I don't see it with all the bells and whistles of Facebook click-through rate and 20% of uptake and whatever people say these days. Yeah. I'm just pragmatic. I'm like, you want more car sales? Give them this, they'll buy it. And they say, we can't do that. I say, well, what can you do? And it's a negotiation. <laughs> so, oh, my God. Well, listen, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it right. If you're going to do it, you've got to do what you love and you've got to do it hard. And there's going to be plenty of doubters around you and plenty of people looking for reasons why it won't work. But listen, with the right mindset, anybody can achieve anything. So um, the thing that really drives me crazy is this fallacy or myth that a lot of people buy into that I can create 10 pages that have the exact same words and change the service name or the city name. Yes, and find replace. Name. Yeah. And, and, oh, I just put 20 pages on my website. No, you put one because Google's going to ignore 19 yeah. of those. Yeah. Uh, and that just makes me crazy. The other thing that drives me nuts is when we see content that's optimized like one page that's optimized for everything because they only have 10 pages on their website so they've got you know every suburb in their title tag and yes. you know all of the services on one page and I'm, oh we gotta we gotta expand here let's get a content calendar going because this isn't gonna cut it um there's a lot if if the small business has not concentrated on marketing in the past and they just don't know, um, they think that their small little website should be able to rank them everywhere. And outside of the zip code of your brick and mortar office or storefront or whatever, you're really going to struggle without content if yeah. be visible at all. And um, if you are a service area business, you're starting out in the hole. You're starting out behind everybody else that has a brick and mortar space that they can list the address of on their GMB listing. So I think that um, those are the things that really kind of, you know, yeah. um, or, or poorly written content with lots of typos, um, you know, things that I get it. Not everybody's a writer and you just, you know, you're trying to get your website up when you started business and, and, you know, you're a plumber, not a wordsmith, right? right <laughs> I get right. it. But there's a lot of help out there to be found. And, and not all of it's affordable to a small business. And some of it is priceless to a yeah. small business. And I think um, solving those problems is probably like the first step. Okay, we just need to create a content calendar and get get going on this. Because if we don't have content to optimize, then we're you know, falling into the keyword cannibalization track where we're trying to make a few pages on a website, do heavy lifting for a lot of fathead keywords that it's just not going to happen. So I think when you can give back to your community in small ways, it doesn't have to be a grand gesture every single time, but when you give back to your community, you get things back from that. And sometimes it's links, sometimes it's mentions, sometimes it's ref referrals and word of mouth. Connecting with those micro influencers in your community and helping them do nice things for their community. Like maybe there's somebody who's really popular in your local area on Instagram, they have a big following. Maybe they're a realtor or something like that. And they're doing a coat drive and you contact them and say, hey, you can have people just drop coats off here for the coat drive. You've got like a coat closet or something by the entry that they can just throw things in. 
um, that influencer is going to be like, oh, great, that's a great idea. And they're going to start spraying out, hey, if you want to donate, here are the places where you can drop off coats. And they're mentioning your name and it's all over their Instagram and all, their network is seeing it. So I think that, you know, working to be a, a solid, um, positive, forward thinking member of your community has multiple benefits. So it's that oh, okay. it's more than just the content. It's the people and the connections and kind of the PopCon family. If you suck in person, you will suck online. Yeah. Do reputation management is one of the strongest things that dealers are missing out on. Uh, customer satisfaction, engineering and reputation management. That makes perfect sense. Google My Business is the website today. Not the website itself. Google My Business is the showroom. The first thing you do when you go to Google My Business, I think for, for the novice is just go to the home page and Google does a nice job of kind of giving you a little report card. They'll say 70% or 50% or 85% complete. And then they'll tell you the pieces that you're missing. And as I mentioned, you know, the, the work is really light lifting. You're just kind of filling in the blanks. You know, you're missing your business description. Oh, great. Let me, let me put in my why buy statement for my dealership. You're missing you know, uh, your short, your short name, your short code. Okay. Well, I'll enter that and see how that works. And images so, are always one. Yeah. You know, images. Yes. Yeah. So, so, and, and the, and the two biggest signals we see are images and reviews in terms of getting those listings to, to be more visible. And so we'll also help you know, direct that for, for, uh, for the dealers. So with automotive, we, we put uh, Google ad spend into five categories, one, their name, their branded name, and two would be uh, what we call make geo. So Chevy dealer near me, Chevy dealer, Cincinnati, um, and then new cars, used cars, and then fixed operations, which we would be service and parts. Uh, the, the brand makes a ton of sense as long as they can get their cost per click really low. Uh, and then the, the, the really the sweet spot for automotive in, in paid search is the make geo. So Ford dealer near me, Ford dealer, Cincinnati, those sort of things. And then for new cars, we're, we're very choosy with that. We want to make sure the dealership has good depth on those new car landing pages so that the, 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 the searcher is satisfied. And then, you know, um, fixed operations, you know, it, um, it's all about the landing page and the offer and being able to really count success. So count leads and scheduled service uh, visits and those sort of things. As you've looked at WordPress that just consistently annoys you from an SEO perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so much, so much. So I, I should be careful with this. So, um, I guess more tactically, there's some... It's really slow to make big changes because it's open source, because it's community, and because you know you can't afford to have a a, a tiny mistake in one line of code hits forty percent of the internet. That's um, that's going to be quite impactful. So everything has to be very rigorously, iteratively tested. I think at that point, then yeah, we need to decide what are we, what do we become. I think there's definitely still a gap where we can step into being consultants on business models and product market fits and communication strategies. But I don't think that's that increasingly less of that is going to involve how do I optimize this web page? How do I speed up this image? How do I prevent these 404s? Way beyond just technical SEO, because um, the less the less of that there is to be done, the more um, crowded spaces like digital PR and content marketing will become because um, we're all going to want to be doing something, right? So it's, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the industry. With everything in SEO, it depends. It's quite a lot that you have going on. Why did you decide to do a newsletter? And also saw the power of newsletter. I was reading more and more of people saying stuff like, oh, I will trade like... Uh, 10,000 followers in Twitter for a thousand subscribers to my newsletter. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think the larger point is just that as advertisers, we need to evolve. Uh, concept I th among devs, among marketers, among all the people in your audience, that there are severe limitations to every one of these tools, even Lighthouse. How do you, how do you respond to those sort of questions? I always explain it in the way that tools are data gatherers they're not data analyzers. Um, you know, it's really frustrating when you see agencies or SEO consultants provide a, a white labeled report generated by a mm -hmm. tool and call that an audit because it's not, it's, it's, you know, it's at best the starting point of an actual audit. Mm -hmm. It's not an audit in and of itself. It lacks context, it lacks meaning. It's just a list of things that are automatically generated. And that is almost useless when you're trying to decide what you're actually going to spend your resources on. You know, 1,200, 1,500 individual cert features. We're talking about every tiny little different change that can happen 
that takes a search result beyond what we think of as the traditional, you know, blue link with the two line description, but still um, they all take us outside of the traditional Mm -hmm. search results and they take up space on the page, which is one of the things we were most interested in when we developed our visibility share product at, uh, uh, at SEO Clarity was to be able to give a more realistic view of your position in the search results. Uh, because just saying like I'm in position three doesn't mean as much anymore if there's other things big and small that are that are pushing right. you further down. Uh, what we were interested in, our clients were interested in first was just real estate yeah. space. Like we all know the further you're down the page, the harder it is to get a click. And now those search features are taking up, literally taking up space that used to be ours to claim. So interesting. So the 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 biggest takeaway is that Search Console, the native tool, allows you to see and analyze and export out in the performance tab a thousand rows at a time. That's the maximum. So okay. anything that has lots of search volume and lots of keyword modifiers, think about like your key brand, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might find that the key brand in Search Console gets you that full thousand rows. You then look at what's available in the API and you'll see that there's 25,000 rows. And and you're like, oh, okay, what's the big whoop? Like, why is that valuable? For me, it's about all of the clicks that are hidden, right? Mm. It's not just the impressions. It's all of the clicks that we don't even have visibility into. A SERP is stable when at least the, the top results don't change on an ongoing basis. And you see this in, in certain rank trackers. Uh, you see that very clearly where for certain keywords, you know, the top five, top six, sometimes top eight don't like barely change week over week, day to day, month over month. And then there are also periods of instability where Google kind of either reevaluates whether they got the SERP mix right, whether they show the right results or something else happens. And then it kind of goes all over the place. And you see that Google tests, okay, what happens when I put this result in the first position or that result in the fifth position, or maybe shuffle that a little bit. Um, and then over time, it comes back to stability. And that's just important for us as SEOs to know for a couple of reasons. For one, it explains when traffic fluctuates and uh, maybe even dips and you, have, you haven't you have changed anything, which happens right. more and more. Uh, and second, it just helps us to find opportunities when there is a time of instability to keep track of how the SERP mix changes and to see if we can tweak, modify, or tune our content to come out on top. Message ads are, you know, LinkedIn on the marketing side, they're very different from the organic side of the platform. As an advertiser though, you're gonna pay 35 to let's say 65 cents to send it to someone. And so you really want it to land. You want it to stand out. You want it to be valuable. So what we've found is if you start with an offer that's like uh, talk to our sales rep or download this free white paper, people just go, eh, like it's not interesting. But if you go to them with a message that really is valuable, some, something that if you got it as a cold email, you'd be excited about rather than marketing it as spam. So things like, because of who you are in the industry, we want to give you early access to something we've built or a sneak peek at something that's coming out, or we're interested in you for a partnership or a job opportunity. If you lead with that kind of opportunity, then um, you know the average open rate is like 55%. The average click-through rate is like, uh, like 3.2%. But when you lead with something of real value that people are excited about, you see things that are like open rates of 70 and 80% and click through rates of, you know, 20%. Is this idea of, I will give you something that is good for you, but first you need to recognize why it's good for you. Now, if I try and tell you it's good for you because I'm saying it's good for you, you're not adopting it. You might be interested, but you're not adopting it as yours was that you predicted purpose and opinions will become more important for brands. In the year of BLM, in the year of the election, uh, this, was, this was spot on. What did you know that, that, uh, that we didn't? And do you think this is a trend that has momentum in a non-election year? Yes, um, I, I do think so. And the, the one thing that got me thinking about that was actually LinkedIn, where maybe, maybe yeah. even Facebook and Twitter, but where I saw this big swing from 
people following brands to people following people, which makes a lot of sense, right? The consumer disconnect today is the fact that we ask as marketers, we ask for everything under the sun and we get so much data, but are we actually using it and utilizing it in a way that makes the customer experience, the customer journey, and the, that makes it better overall for the customers? Are we impacting their journey? Are we impacting their experience? Or are we collecting it and then not having the ability to use it or leverage it in a way that improves their experience. There, there's this interesting bit where it's the delineation of paid and organic, and it doesn't necessarily ring true to all marketers of where that delineation sets. What I agree with is this whole idea of um, audience research, persona research, buyer research, really understanding who your buyers are, because it's easy, it's really easy to try to be everything to everyone. You know, and that happens a lot right. in the SaaS world. And, you know, even internally between the different tools, you know, there would be these moments where I'm like, no, let's like, you know, great us for a long time. I was like, let's just be reputation management for agencies to help their clients. You know, let's mm. be that because it's a different right. set of tools um, that are, that an agency would want than the individual, you know, end user small business. So I think that from a content marketing standpoint, perspective, it's always important to take a step back and reflect about who are you who are you trying to sell to? So I, I think the better way of understanding product-led SEO is to, is to think about the way SEO is typically done. And that's what I talk a lot about in the beginning of the book, which is the way SEO is typically done is you go in and find some keywords that your product or your business is about, and then you go to a search keyword tool and they're really all the same, whether you're paying for one or whether you're using Google. You get the top searched keywords for that industry or for your vertical, and then you go and write some content, and then you do a bunch of tactics and you hope it's going to rank. But really, there's no real thought about, or not enough thought about the user. Like, if Google's the machine you're writing for and you want to rank on Google, great. But if you want to sell to a human, you want a human to click on that and then click buy. And like, again, there's a lot of aspects to SEO, which are not the typical aspects that you know SEO might think of. And then also not being, this is the history and the story of copy press, not being afraid to try something new mm. and scrap it if it doesn't work. You know what I mean? But I think, you know, what I've been doing a lot of for the last few years is when you create content, create it in a way where you can use it in multiple ways, right? So create an ebook that you can slice into an infographic that you can slice into a couple of newsletters that you can slice into a couple of blog posts right and so now um you've got a, a bunch of different assets that you can you're trying to get a couple base hits rather than hitting a grand slam every time off the content i'm uh i kind of feel like in those old-timey circuses where there's like the plate jugglers and like spinning stuff and then running back and forth. And you feel stuff. like that? Yeah. I feel like I'm doing that, but then like someone also let out the circus elephants at the same time. <laughs> and they're stampeding. Well, I, <laughs> anything I do, I want to do with my own two hands first to kind of understand what can happen and what goes wrong. So for the first sort of six months, I was doing all of it. Whereas companies tend to come at it through the lens of like, let's show them our biggest successes. And it's like, your big success might not yeah. matter one whit to someone who doesn't have that problem. I know my problems, yeah, I know my goals. If I see that reflected in the way that that's presented, that's where I'll go. That That is what I would say if I was having beer with someone who was like, why would I ever get a conversion cover? Is because you are so <laughs> in the thick of your business. And like every business owner, you think you know your customers so well, you think you know them inside and out that you've probably lost the ability to really see them and really hear them. And there's probably gaps that mm. are there that you're just not seeing. And that's what a good copywriter is gonna come in and do. They're gonna find those gaps, they're gonna close those gaps, they're gonna position you in a way that, you know, you can't swap logos and still think it's some other company. They're gonna give you that edge. They're gonna make you the best answer, very similar to, to SEO, right? You want your content to be the best answer. You want your company to be the most relatable, the best mirror, the best, place people see themselves in that offer so the reason that we started getting into uh the whole podcasting is because dave and i hate you know we hate blogging we hate writing we hate anything related to that but we love talking with each other and so yeah. you know it, it uh, took both of us pushing each other to finally do it 
Well, you know, number one, people want actionable uh, information. And let me just preface it, preface that by saying everybody's in the audience for a different reason. You got folks who are new. You got mm -hmm. folks who are experienced. You got folks right in the middle like, hey, what's this guy know or, or, or woman know? I'm going to stop in this session. So it really depends on the audience to start with. You can have a very appropriate speaker give up and just give a knockout uh, presentation for intro SEOs, and it turns out it's all advanced people in the audience, and they're not going to give it a great review. Mm. So that's the starter, knowing your audience, knowing who's in the audience. Um, yeah. Are you going to PubCon, or are you going to the local marketing group? Are you going to the Rotary Club? Um, I've been on both sides of that. I've been at advanced SEOs and given great presentations. And then I've been totally ill-prepared. I was like, what have you learned about structured data in the last year? And um, and she was like, I've learned that like it's not just an SEO strategy, but it's a really important content strategy. Content, and, yeah. and it was... How have you seen humor work to kind of stop thumbs or make for effective content on LinkedIn? Also, humor is serious business. The, the <laughs> humor works. A, it's like really, it's so relatable. People want to. And it also, I mean, research has shown that humor actually helps things be more memorable in your head. And it also allows brands to to build that memorability, right? There's all this research, like numerous studies show this, that in for consumers like B2C, people have to engage with your you know, your creatives right. five to seven times before they remember you in B2B. It's like 10, 11 plus times before they remember you. And there's a study by Gartner that shows like 71% of people will rate uh, you almost the same as your competitors. So if mm -hmm. your brands are not as distinctive as we tend to think they are. So one ways we can stand out is through personality and humor is a really good way to show personality because it is engaging. And if I can give one tip for how to do that, it can be through like visual consistency. Like very often people use stock images, but there's a lot of commoditization where ads and creatives will look the same, but put in like, what's your distinctive brand DNA? Is it like color? Is it your logo? Is it a, a saying? Put that in every sort of visual place, whether it's a display ad, whether it's your image ad on LinkedIn, whether it is, you know, you know, MSAN ad on Microsoft, you know, whatever the platform, if it's visual, reinforce it. Myth number one, my customers only use Google. John that's Lee correct. <laughs> I say, I say that's, that's just no, it's, it's not true. Um, if you look at PCs only, um, where we're like two out of five of, of all searches, you know, whatever, two out of five, if you look at all devices, so including mobile tablets, um, you know, it's like, you know, one out of one out of three, something like that. But like big picture, it's it's not just Bing. I mean, yes, it's Bing, but it's Bing. It's AOL. It's Yahoo. It's a multitude of high quality search partners, including DuckDuckGo, for those that didn't know that. Um, it's a very big addressable market. And that's just search, let alone what we can offer you with native ads. For, for those who don't know, what is an example of a linkable asset? How are these used in, in a link building campaign? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great uh, uh, question and in, an important one too. It's essentially what's the justification for a for a or earning a link to that page kind of thing. What is the unique element, the data, the information, the study, the comparison? You know, the the pricing or the reviews. Something that we need to have a little a little bit of uh, meat to, so that we can that we could justify essentially the link to that page. We're going to we're going to go ask this publisher to link to this page. What's in it for them? What's in it for the publisher kind of thing? And so from from that perspective, we are looking for some element. Uh, I think one of the go to kinds of presentations or articles to write for link building agency or digital PR is the outreach side, because it really is. It's the exciting part. It's ooh, what's going to happen. You know, it's you finally planted the seed and when you've watered it and now you're waiting for it to sprout, you know, it's really an exciting moment. Um, but it's also one that I think is really easy to overthink. Uh, <laughs> I know from experience, it's really easy to overthink. Uh, so, um, uh, on the outreach side, I'd have to say, you know, we're, we're pretty straightforward right now. Um, just, Hey, we'd love to, uh, write an article for you, or we've got a, a, a topic that we think would be great for your blog. What do you think? 
uh, stuff like that. And it's we're not real super, um, you know, Mark, you wouldn't, I don't think you'd be super uh, inspired mm -hmm. by us. Um, but James, I, I do downplay and underplay. James, overplay now, please. Hyperbolize yeah, that's, my um, hypoperbolize. The, the the keep it short and simple method is a good method, as Garrett was, but that's really the what he's describing there. It's not that, you know, we've already done the qualifying of the publisher. We've, we're really looking to find the publishers that align with the client's website as, as an agency or as an in-house with your, with your website and your content. That piece is sort of baked into the outreach that we're doing. So, yes, we want it to be straightforward and not a huge block of text because we know they're not going to see that. But at the same time, it's got to be personalized to a point where you don't have that experience that you mentioned. We get those all the time. You know, our, <laughs> our site says link building all over it, and we still get pitches from someone yeah. saying, hey, we want to we have them. this piece of content. I, I we have this guys. article. Yeah, but, I, but, love, but I, I, I love this stuff. I mean, it's, it's always, to me, like a little bit of an inspiration or like, oh, that's a nice element. Or, oh, that's a nice detail. I would say study it all. The stuff you don't like is still a lesson. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't make you click. It's... Oh my God. And so yes. I was thinking about the other day, I was like, damn, this is revolutionary. Man, that's fast. Like Man, that, yeah. that's fast. 